Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fresh Ink Showcase with the National Library of Scotland. I'm Nadi Naisha Jasset, and it has been a pleasure to have led on this project with the National Library of Scotland and to be here tonight welcoming our 10 emerging writers commissioned to write about their experiences of 2020 as part of Fresh Ink. I want to send a welcome to our audience. I understand that you're joining us from around the world tonight, and I hope that you, like me, was having a little boogie to our entrance music there. We are joined in that. Um, I'd like to say a huge welcome to all of our Fresh Ink writers. We're going to be hearing from each of them tonight, and a big welcome as well to the supporting staff from the National Library who are doing the tech behind the scenes. So that's to Kenny and Beth. Welcome, everybody. The format of tonight will be a short introduction from myself. Well, I say short, but if you know me, it might be slightly longer. <laughs> Followed by a five minute Q&A with each of the commissioned writers to hear more about their pieces. If you would like to read any of the commissioned works, and I really strongly suggest you do because they're a fantastic selection. Or if you want to find out more about our writers tonight, please visit www.nls.uk forward slash fresh dash Inc. So, the tech format of tonight's event is a webinar. This means that we can't see you, the audience, but we know you're there and we appreciate you coming to help us celebrate the project so much. You'll probably see me on screen for most of the time, and then each of our participants are going to come up and join me, with the exception of Amy Jardine. She wasn't able to make it tonight, but we're going to be sharing a pre recorded video with her. A little bit more about Fresh Ink. So it began in December 2020 with the National Library of Scotland launching a call for pictures from emerging writers in Scotland on my experience of 2020 to be part of a new initiative called Fresh Inc. It came from a desire at the National Library of Scotland to deliver an initiative which would support and develop Scotland's emerging literary talent and which would capture the moments, both big and small, of writers' narratives of what has been a world-changing year, which would then be held in the National Library of Scotland's archives. The National Library wanted to hear from a wide range of experiences so that our final 10 would be from a chorus singing different notes of the same year, building a project that is a tapestry of voices and different perspectives and experiences. 250 people submitted pictures and we only had 10 places. And those 250 who submitted shared their ideas of what they would explore if they were chosen. Each one of these pictures held something wonderful to offer. And there was so much value both in the stories they wanted to tell, but also how people wanted to tell them. It was a great honor to read them. And I'd like to thank everybody who submitted their pictures at the early stage. There were plays, there were pantoums, there were postcards, there was parenthood, and there was the strongest sense that Scotland's literary future is in very, very good hands. The final 10 were chosen by a panel of four. Myself, a writer and creative practitioner, Colin McIlroy, who is the curator of modern literary manuscripts at the National Library of Scotland, Michelle McLeod, who is the professor of Gaelic at the University of Aberdeen and the director of the Confucius Institute, and Alan Lynch, who is the Writing Communities Coordinator for Live Literature at the Scottish Book Trust. So a huge thank you to them, my fellow panellists as well. It was a mammoth task, but we're so pleased to have our final 10 writers with us tonight. And like I said again, I urge you to go online and check them out. So introducing our final 10, we have Sean Y. Kyung, Nazmi McCartney, Susie Kelly, Sam Clark, Candice Perwin, Amy Jardine, Sonali Misra, J.D. Stewart, Jude Reed, and May Dian Sangu. And they are a fantastic bunch, and I'm so excited to get a little bit of time to chat to each of them tonight. I think our audience members are going to love it. And so we are going to start off, and I would like to welcome with Sean, I would like to welcome Sean Y. Kyung to the, the Zoom stage. Um, welcome, Sean. Hey Sean. Hi Nadine, how you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, very good, very good. It's great to be here and uh, thank you for that amazing introduction. 
Oh, honestly, it's so lovely to have you and thank you for, for being the first to start us off. Um, so I was wondering, since you are opening the night, if you could tell us a bit more about your piece, The Recipe. So The Recipe, it's a visual style long poem broken up into four different sections. Uh, and each section contains within it a recipe for a particular food, a memory that I have of the year and some other sort of assorted information uh, some of which is biographical, others of which is more um, technical or political about the various events that have happened. And hopefully sort of together, this whole mishmash of things combined into a uh, confusing experience. I think you know, for a lot of people, 2020 was a very confusing year. So I wanted to sort of have a bit of um, uncertainty in, in the piece and um, but yeah, it's all sort of focused around food and the, the main sort of holding me mechanic throughout all of the poems um, is food and the making of food. Mm. And it's, it's a wonderful piece. And exactly as you say, it blends memory, it blends events, it blends a memoir in many ways and food. And I was wondering, so I know this is something that, that you do a lot. Why is, what is it about food writing as a centre that brings in all of these bigger issues? Because it works so well for the reader. So my individual background is sort of um, as a, you know, I grew up basically in a takeaway family. Um, and so I always was very aware of this concept of food as a device for connecting communities together, because that was a lot of my family's interactions with people was through customer service through the selling and making of food uh, and so yeah it's all sort of started from that and then as I sort of got it more into writing and trying to write about different topics the more I started to realize that I could write about these things through food and it was a way that I could encourage more people to access the kind of things I wanted to write about so for instance you know um, you know it, it Maybe you know, maybe people out there don't have the same experience I do of sort of mixedness or mixed raceness or something like that. But a lot of people out there will have an experience of takeaway food. And takeaway food is its own kind of mixed thing. And so by talking about mixedness through that medium, it's sort of a doorway into that. And beyond all that as well, food is just sort of something that's really connective, I think, uh, in individually everyone will have their own experience of food, whether that's positive, negative, um, you know, sort of, you know, people consider themselves an expert in food, other people consider themselves a novice in food, and it's just a really great way of bringing people together, I think. So, yeah, that's sort of where it all started. It's such a perfect answer, and I feel like you draw, you know, you tell a story with your answer, um, and draw in so much of yourself, but also, I think you highlight the way you, you talk about food is something that that can connect communities and people and for me also that that is what writing can be as well right um I'm aware as a writer that it's it's been a, a big year for you you've got um sort of a spoken word show and you've got a, a debut collection coming out so what has that been like in this really changing time to, to sort of be sharing your work what has that been like yeah it's been it's been a challenge in a good way um you know it's sort of on the one hand, it's been very negative, the experience of 2020, with the sort of isolation and, you know, sort of all these weird, confusing feelings. And, but on the other hand, it's given me the time to really focus on what I want to do and my own writing and sort of, you know, having to be sort of very focused uh, rather than having to do lots of things all at once. And so the collection that you mentioned uh, that was published by Verve in April uh, that's actually a lot of the poems in that are all about restaurants, uh, Glasgow, Glasgow restaurants specifically. And once again, that was to do with me wanting to try and write something connective through food. And then the, the sort of spoken word show, that's also sort of around food in its own different way. So, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all sort of um, going really well, but it all comes from a place of basically not having much else to do, which, um, <laughs> you know, it was one of the weird kind of, sort of positives about the year I suppose. And you say oh I've not had much else to do but from where I'm sitting you have achieved a huge huge amount um, and it's such a joy to have you as part of Fish Inc um, and it's just a last line to our listeners if they want to find out more about your show or buy your book where can they go? 
Uh, yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. It's, I'm very lucky in that I've got a quite a unique name. So at Sean Wai Kyung and everything. Uh, Sean Wai Kyung dot C-A-R-R-D dot co is my website as well, if you prefer that way, rather than all this social media nonsense. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean. It's been a pleasure having you and I'm looking forward to moving to Nazmi McCartney next. Um, so thank you so much, Sean. Um, honestly, I just know that I'm going to want to talk to each of you all the time. Um, and I will welcome Nazmi McCartney, um, another one of our Fresh Ink poets. Hey, Nazmi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's really good to see you. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. And it was a joy um, to read your poetry. And I obviously have had the joy of, of knowing what you've written, but I was wondering if you could introduce to our audience tonight a bit more about your poems for Fresh Ink. Yeah, so um, I worked on five poems for Fresh Ink. Um, and I decided to write them all on the themes of loss, loneliness and solace you know we all lost things and I think everyone was impacted by more loneliness than usual and the only way to get through like the maddening kind of day to day was to find places to take solace you know it was different for me than like usual light escapism it was more like consoling myself and I decided to write my poems on those three themes. And would you say that at least it is for me that act, the act of writing is or sometimes can be that act of seeking solace and, and giving it to oneself? Yeah and I definitely did that with these poems and I think before I decided on what I would write about, I thought, well, what was my experience of 2020? Mm. And there were a lot of things happen, a lot of bad things. And I spent much of my time last year and this year really, really angry, mm. like every day. And it was exhausting, but there were so many. I was, I was just like slapped in the face again with how selfish people can be. And and I lost a lot of faith in people. I lost a lot of friends. And I felt that there were a lot of people wrong in me and wrong in others. And there was, you know, a big sense of loss in that way and loss of time. And as things went on and I was very isolated the whole year, I felt like I was losing myself, that, like the who I was before with a capital B. Um, mm. And, you know, I started to write a few angry poems and they wouldn't, they didn't really help me and they didn't really go anywhere. And I think if I decided to write a bunch of angry poems about my experience 2020, that would have been fine. But then I thought, well, you know, there's all of these big bad things going on for me to do with being working class and that being harder during the pandemic, racism, there's lots of terrible things happening to other people and and I just wanted to instead think about well, what what is my day-to-day -day like apart from that and I think I was quite a, I felt like I was losing a lot of my softness and that made me sad and then I thought I want to write about my feelings of loss and loneliness in a soft and delicate way and I want to I want to make something to make something nice out of a really hard year and so that's why I decided to write in the direction I did and I'm really glad I did and yeah I'm really happy with how they turned out and they helped me more than the angry writing I was doing was, which is something that might change again, but no, I'm, yeah. I just like, it's such an honour and such a joy to get to listen to the the story behind it 
um because like hearing you speak i just think oh you've got a poet's heart because it you know it could be my own self uh sort of saying about how we we navigate um anger and what it does to us while also recognizing that anger is really necessary and i know that audrey lord one of my favorite writers um talks about anger being useful um while also hearing this reflection from you about about gentleness and needing that at that time um Oh, it's just it's wonderful and, and one question I wanted to ask you before we um before I have to let you go and I don't want to um, is that in your work you you often draw on these fairy tale themes and these fairy tale images and I wondered if there's any reflections you would share on that or building I imagine on what you've already said yeah I think I've got lost in fairy tale worlds and my imagination since I was a little kid and I've always held on to that even into my adulthood and I think finding the magic in, in things in everyday life and the things around me and in myself and other people is really important and oh, what I was going to say there, what I was going to say next. Um, I mean, that was very perfect though as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's been, it's always been, helped me keep going forward, but even more so last year, it was really important to me. Oh, that's me. Well, thank you so much. And I just feel like, gosh, hearing from Sean and then hearing from you one, one back to back it's just building such a rich portrait of what we wanted to achieve with this project. So thank you so much, Nazmi. Um, it's been a joy to speak to you. Um, and we're going to be joined by another writer who takes things slightly magically too, which is which is Susie Kelly. Um, but thanks so much, Nazmi. Bye. <laughs> and welcome, Susie. Hi, Susie. Hi, Nadine. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. <laughs> how are you? Oh, it's a joy to have you. I am, I am very good. Um, my laptop's shaking slightly, but I don't think anyone else can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if to start us off, you could tell us a bit more about your piece um, and, and yeah, introduce it to us. Um, well, my piece stems from, uh, it's a line from a very famous Bowie song um, that um, it was about my experience of chronic illness of mental health disabilities. Um, and being a housebound person before the pandemic and how that kind of changed in a most peculiar way mm. um, when it happened. Um, because I had 12 years to get used to um, having a restricted life and not being able to go out, not being able to see people. And when I saw other people initially dealing with that, they very rightly um, expressed anger, frustration, fear. And I had spent so long knowing my experience that I'd forgot what their experience was like and how to have that suddenly fall upon you. So the story was really about me challenging that bitterness and resentfulness in myself, um, also confronting my social uh, dislocation. And through writing the piece, um, it was kind of like in space oddity, Major Tom decides to sever his connection. <laughs> I had, I, by the end of it, I had chosen, I wanted to reconnect with Earth because here comes Zoom and I'm going to events at um, the Book Festival. I'm going to um, local author events. I'm going to things like um, shout out to Air, Air Writers Club, I'm going to local writing club events. Um, and it was just through doing that, building that sense of community again and finding those little moments of human connection it then helped me towards the end of the year when we lost uh, the World Commission Specialist Wolf. Um, and just having that uh, feedback from new friends, it made a world of difference. And I didn't feel dislocated from society anymore. Like mm -hmm. there was a part for me to play and maybe mm -hmm. I had something worthwhile to offer back to help others navigate lockdown. Oh, and you, you definitely had something to offer back because even hearing you say, you know, when we lost mission specialist Wolf, um, and I think anybody who's who's had a chance to read the piece already will know exactly about the moment you're talking about. And I remember it being one of those moments as a reader where I was just like, you know, um, I felt it. You did that sharing, um, 
that Sean's talked about. And yes, yeah, and finding that as 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 Nazmi was saying as well, finding that softness within that as well, yeah. and beyond the anger. Yeah, it was a very cathartic experience, and I wouldn't have had it had it not been for fresh ink and the whole project. So thank you very much. It's been wonderful. And I feel like it should be us who is thanking you. <laughs> And I wanted to, one of the bits that I loved about your piece was, um, and I believe we were even slightly tweeting about this earlier, was the metaphor or the world you build around space um, and astronauts. And so tell me a bit more about why you chose to use that, that setting, that imagery. It came from um, listening to um, Spotify one night and Space Oddity came on mm. and I find it a very melancholic song and I, f I identified with that drifting away and feeling no part of this planet down below mm. uh, and it reminded me of um, Chris Hadfield and um, he was commander of the International Space Station I think in 2013 and he recorded a version of that um, and but Bowie saw it and tweeted hello space boy and just those little triggers of um, connection happening it just rippled through and it just brought me from being launched out into the space free falling mm -hmm. um, in despair it brought me back um, and allowed me to find a version of home again. Mm. Oh Susie even <laughs> even the way you talk I think paints a picture of what people can expect um, in your piece. And I would really encourage our audience tonight, um, if you can, to go on YouTube and to look up um, Susie's video and what they've done, because, it, yeah, I don't want, no spoilers, but you, you've done a wonderful feat of digital storytelling um, there as well. Thank you so much um, for joining us and for, for sharing your words and for your piece. Um, and before we go, where can we get to know your work or follow your work? Um, well, I am all over social media, <laughs> so the best place to find me is at www.susieakelly.com and everything is on there and all the social media connections. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> and apologies to Nazmi as well. I, I didn't ask you where we can follow your work, but I, I know that the National Library of Scotland are going to be tweeting it. Um, very much. So next up, I'm going to invite Sam Clark. And while I do that, I'm going to very subtly try and fiddle with my camera that keeps shaking. <laughs> Welcome, Sam. Hello, Nadine. How's your <laughs> camera? It's not going to fall over, is it? <laughs> you know what? It, if it did, it would be in the theme of the years we are discussing. Um, thank you so much for being here. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your piece, Treading Water. Yeah, so um, the piece I wrote on for Fresh Ink is a kind of lyric essay or personal essay. Um, I live in Orkney and um, I wanted to, through writing, just think about that strange kind of sensation of being at the same time kind of insulated from the real kind of you know the events going on that we had until quite recently we had very few cases on the island and um, there is a real sense of community here and I was fortunate enough to be you know living in somewhere where they have plenty of open space the sea nearby outside space um, but at the same time this awareness of this slow catastrophe un unfolding and affecting people that I love and care about and not being able to see them and yeah just trying to uh, trying to sort of figure that out because this one you know I could see the natural world around me was still unfolding and doing its stuff I chose to write about this summer particularly um because that's when it felt most uh, most um the most dissonant really because the tourists didn't arrive, but the guillemots did, and the kittiwakes did, and the eider ducks did, and they were all busy doing all of their stuff, and yet everything else was really quiet. Um, mm. And yeah, I, it, the main kind of motif that I kept coming back to was looking at water, um, mm. a fascination with water. I'm surrounded by water where I, I live, and it seemed... Um, like a really tangible phenomenon that we're all familiar with, but something that offers us a way to think about and approach 
much more abstract or tricky or difficult ideas or realities like the passage of time, um, like transience, ephemerality, our mortality, um, and also about um, boundaries and, um, you know, the boundary of the sea, but actually it's really a connection. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of water being also like a kind of spiritual boundary, it's a boundary between death and life, it's um, just a really rich kind of thing to think with. Mm -hmm. No, completely. And um, yeah, even it also echoes with my own personal relationship with the sea as well. So it's it's beautiful to hear you talk about it. And I found when I was reading your piece, and I think audience members who, who read it as well will feel the same, I really felt like I was sort of in your feet. You know, the, there's a very meditative way to how you write that you um you brought us to the sediment in the soil, you brought us to the brush strokes on the page. And I wondered if this this sort of small scale grounding is what I'm going to call it. Was this something that was deliberate on your part? And if so, why? Um, deliberate in that um, perhaps it was a sort of response to this um, ungrounding sense of, of, of disorientation. I think every all of us felt really disoriented. That, you know, March, April, it was like, what's going on? And also kind of everything moving on a global scale. So to kind of not get dizzy with all of that, to just, uh, I've, I've found myself really looking at the smallest detail of how water moves or, or fascination of, of just, because I was here all the time. That's the other thing, watching the season change in a way, in a, with a continuum you know, never, well, you know, didn't go anywhere, but there were no ferries anyway, or you weren't allowed on the ferries. So just observing these tiny changes of the plants as they were shifting, um, like a lot of people, I'm very fortunate, I've got a garden. So I was, I'm always, I always try and grow vegetables anyway, but like a lot of people last year, I went into overdrive, you know, with the, with the Brexit and everything. So I had like, in the summer, there was a lot of vegetables coming up. So I was also really kind of focusing on on that. You know, you're looking, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to how's your, how's your little seedlings doing? Do they need water? Do they need, have you got caterpillars? You know, there's some minutiae, um, but it's also very um, grounding in a way to, to bring you back to the moment. I think mm -hmm. that's it, just being, paying attention is really, uh, a way to um, stop yourself from spiraling off mm -hmm. into catastrophizing and what's going to happen in the future and um, just being in the moment and paying attention to beauty and change. Mm -hmm. And I feel like all of our writers tonight have have captured something that is so inherent to the year of 2020 in all of its different ways and I think with yours it is that that groundingness of I can only be here, you know, I can only be now and that almost like you say, Mary Oliver, like paying attention and, and looking at even the small rivulets and that um, I'm almost reminded of what we were talking about with with Nazmi and with Susie about that, um, the gentleness or the, or the peace. Um, there's so much more that I want to ask you, but unfortunately um, we don't have time, but just a quick shout out if people want to follow you after. Uh, yeah, well, my website is um, just samanthaclark.net. Don't forget, there's no E on the Clark. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you go there, you'll find I've, uh, I'm Sam Clark Art Right on social media. But go to my website, you'll find all the all the info. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I want to say to all of the people we've had so far, I literally could talk to you all for hours. Um, but next up, and thank you, Sam. Next up, we have Candice Perwin. Um, who was our graphic novelist, our graphic artist of the 10. Um, so welcome to Candice. Hey Candice. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's lovely to have you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much. And to be amongst so many uh, amazing uh, artists. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible crowd to be a part of. Mm. And some beautiful conversations, which um, it's so thrilling to have you as a part of as well. Um, I was wondering, as as we've we've done so far, if you'd be okay with telling us a bit more about your piece to introduce it to the audience. Uh, yeah, it was a weird one. I think when I saw the brief, I immediately was like, 
oh, well, it has to be um, this. So uh, I think during 2020, like everybody, um, well, like a lot of people, there was like a lot of self-isolation and um, like uncertainty. And the way I usually navigate these things is through reading, like I read a lot anyway. Um, and uh, I love libraries. I love working libraries and I love borrowing books. I think it's such a magical thing to have um, access to just all this free knowledge and stories. Um, and so when libraries suddenly began closing and everything kind of shut down, it was a real, uh, it was a, uh, it felt like a real severance. It was really strange. Um, but between the books I had already kind of gathered the massive stack you usually have and you never get through, you usually have to return a bunch of them. Um, and then this time I was like, oh, I get to go through the whole stack. <laughs> That's a um, mixed blessing. Um, and then with digital borrowing, uh, with like the Overdrive app, I was able to kind of still access all these things and feel like um, the library world is still a part of my world. And uh, I managed to read uh, like 52 books. So that kind of worked. Although 2020 was actually 53 weeks long because 2020 just wouldn't play ball with anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and so each of the books suddenly began to kind of like feed into the things that were happening at the time, either things I was thinking or feeling, the political moments happening, um, the, the uh, grief, the rage, the yeah, like uh, the obviously the massive political movements that are happening, um, uh, BLM, like it was, there was so much that seemed to be filtered through these things that um, these beautiful books and books are in a, in a moment that was so isolated, books are little windows in some people's minds. You know, it's, it, it was like having humans there telling you stories or helping you navigate a little boat through these really rough waters. And that comes across in the piece. I know at, at one point you talk about um, the lending library on George IV Bridge, which will, was the same sort of places where the National Library is, um, as a, you call it a solace. Um, and you talk about, you know, just the impact that those have had. And it's not lost on me um, that, you know, you've written a piece about the books you read, um, which is a story in itself, your piece that's then going to be held in a lab, in a library archive. Um, and there's something so beautifully circular about that. Um, and so I wondered if you could just tell us a bit more about the, the impact that stories have. You know, you've said that stories and books are so important, but I wonder if you could draw that out a bit more for us because I'm fascinated to hear. It's like being able to immerse yourself in this incredible river of knowledge and like historical and modern and that it's always there and it's always kind of like rumbling around us with all this wisdom and all of this like and like a gathering of human experience um and it and and then and you just get to like it nourishes you and you get to be fed by it and then in this way in some way I'm able to like contribute to it and like to for this piece to go into an archive like it's uh kind of incredible to be yeah to be a part of that that river yeah oh, it's such you have a beautiful way of describing it um and which should be no surprise having read your piece um which is obviously stories told through art as well and I think the thing that I found about your your piece is that it's it's everything you have captured so much and so creatively um, in terms of your creative process. How did you go about bringing together your personal narrative, the global narratives, the books you'd read? How did you go about weaving all that together? I think that is the exhausting thing my brain is doing all the time <laughs> anyway. And so being able to like ordering that into images, into boxes, into little like shorter snippets of words that can then be connected to drawings that can then feed into other things is, is I think it's how I'm processing everything anyway and so it it it's almost like I want to translate that and then share it. it's my way of communicating with others I think to try and take that mess of noise and be like okay mm -hmm. and now you try and understand it too <laughs> yeah. 
gosh, I'm really struck by the parallels between between everybody who's come so far tonight. Um, Candice, just before we, we move over to Sonali, I was wondering if you could share, or to Amy Jardine even, sorry, um, I probably gave Sonali a wee panic there, sorry Sonali. <laughs> I was wondering if you could share where we can um, follow you or, or stay in touch. Sure, um, my website is just um, candiceparwin.com and Parwin's P-U-R-W-I-N, or I'm on Instagram as Goblin Parwin. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Candice, um, and thank you for your work. And then we're going to now have our little tech shift um, where I believe I will disappear. And Beth from the National Library is going to share Amy Jardine's uh, piece and our, we're going to time travel <laughs> um, back to, to my chat with her. Hi, Amy. It is so lovely to have you with us. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your piece, Night Swimming. Um, so when you first saw the Fresh Ink Commission calling for new writing on someone's experience of 2020, what made you think, right, this Night Swimming, this is the piece I want to write. This is the story I want to tell. Um, well, I already had it in my head. Um, after I had my baby, somebody said to me, you should try and write down what it all feels like because you probably will forget a lot of the things that are happening, um, you know, because of sleep deprivation and all the things that come along with having a baby. Uh, so I had already been writing down whenever I could snatch a few minutes, um, little ideas and thoughts about what it was like to have a baby during a pandemic. Um, and then I saw this and I just thought, well, yeah, I think there's, it's an interesting thing. I think there's some value in kind of expanding on this. Um, and then the more I thought about it, the more it just, uh, it just sort of expanded in my mind. And I started really thinking about how I was feeling and the way that I was telling myself all these stories um, about the fact that I felt very safe and that my baby was safe. Um, and so, yeah, it all just sort of came together in my mind. Um, and then I decided I would I would offer it as a, a, an idea to the Fresh Ink program. And it's felt so lovely to think that other people are also going to read this. Um, because I was also, I, when I wrote it, I was trying to think of, of people who've had babies or are just kind of interested in that sort of thing. And, and I wanted to be very, very honest. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad that it's kind of, yeah, been reached by uh, lots of people. A hundred percent. And it, it is honest and it it's reflective and it's very much your voice. It's a piece where it feels like it's it's your voice coming across. And as you said earlier, you know, it's you telling a story in a piece that's so much about storytelling. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the theme that storytelling takes in the piece or the role that storytelling played in, in 2020 for you? Um, yeah, so in the piece, I I looked at storytelling and the way I certainly used it um, quite deliberately, I think, to, to kind of get myself through a very, very difficult time. Um, I sort of, sometimes not even consciously, um, convinced myself that I was completely safe during pregnancy um, that my baby would be absolutely fine. Um, I was ill for quite a lot of my pregnancy and that was before the pandemic. Um, so I started from then to just to just convince myself that it was, you know, that everything was going to have a happy ending. Um, and so I really wanted to write about the way that storytelling, it's not just like entertainment, it's, it's to do with mental health, um, it's a way to keep yourself resilient. Um, and it is also, I mean, it is a little bit of pretending, like pretending the world isn't as bad as it really is. Um, so those were all the things I was thinking about when I was writing the piece. Uh, I think I think in the piece, I actually refer to storytelling as sort of like medicine. Um, and I find that linked in with magic as well, because it's a sort of... Um, 
not to sound too like <laughs> like sort of schmaltzy, but it, you know the medicine and magical thing kind of links together with the idea of helping yourself through difficult times using like rituals and and whatever works for you really. Um, so yeah, that that was kind of what was going through my mind. Um, and then in the piece, once I started thinking about what I was doing with storytelling, I started to see it everywhere. Um, I write about all over social media. I saw people kind of constructing the different narratives and different versions of reality, um, not all of which I agreed with. Um, and even in what appear to be straightforward news stories, I was seeing there was this sort of underneath um, the sort of current of storytelling. Um, the one that I mentioned is that I noticed at the start of the pandemic, there were all kinds of news stories about how it was really good for the environment, um, like noise pollution was going down, light pollution was going down. Um, and I just thought that's, you know, that there's such an emotional um, thing behind that. Like it is news, it's straightforward news, but it's also so much just saying, look on the bright side and, you know, and maybe there, this is bigger than us and look at how it's affecting the rest of the world and not just humans. And so I'm, I'm so pleased and I know the National Library of Scotland is as well that we've got your story in the archive as part of Fishing. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us, for sharing your piece with us. Um, and yeah, I really encourage audience members to, to access the archive and to watch the footage of you also reading a little clip from it as well. Welcome back everyone. Um, that was our little input from Amy there, uh, which we recorded earlier in the week. Um, and Amy, if you're watching this back on, on YouTube, um, we're sending you some love. Um, so next we are moving on to Sonali. Um, sorry about the false alarm, <laughs> Sonali. I did wonder if I missed the cue. <laughs> No, that was all me. Don't you worry. Um, thank you so much for your piece, dear Sonali. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about it. Sure, of course. Um, when I saw the call out for the Freshing program, I first thought of writing a fiction piece because although the last few pieces that I've published have been nonfiction, I do see myself as a fiction writer. But when I tried analyzing my experience of 2020, which I still couldn't really analyze because I felt I was too close to it, I was too caught up in it, I couldn't distance myself to create this other character and have them go through this hell that all of us had been going through last year. I felt I could only write nonfiction. But whenever I do write nonfiction, I like to play with the form and kind of nudge the rules to, you know, of what we consider nonfiction. So my piece eventually, which is titled Dear Sonali, ended up being a letter that I write to my past self, the Sonali I was on 1st January 2020, before any of this happened, as I try to tell her, warn her, maybe like rage at her a little bit, because it sounds really weird, but I was very envious of the person I was, because I seemed a lot more naive and innocent. Um, I still, like, I mean, it's been so many months now that I've written this letter. I still don't know what the aim was, <laughs> what I was trying to accomplish through it. So yeah, my personal essay ended up being a letter that I write to my past self to tell her what lies ahead. And I think sort of hearing you speak about feeling envious of your past self, it reminds me a bit of what Nazmi was saying about the, um, the before, you know, the, the before and after and, and I'm also reminded of um, Susie's approach and how reflective, you know, how reflective this commission, I think, has been um, for so many of us. And I think yours, yours is the only letter, even though you say you say it's in part a love letter to your mother um, and it it's obviously in part a letter to yourself. And I was wondering why the letter form, what could you achieve in the format of a letter that another form wouldn't wouldn't do? I think I wrote the letter because I wanted to address it basically just to myself. I wanted to only talk about my experiences, even though I experienced what most others did as well. Although obviously our circumstances have been very different. So even as we're all facing this pandemic, which is still going on and among so many other things that happened next uh, last year, 
all of our experiences have been slightly different as well. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to talk about, I mean, I kind of wanted to be selfish, I guess, in the moment and just talk about my feelings and my experiences. And I felt the best listener for this would be myself mm-hmm. and not someone else who was also facing through their own mm-hmm. struggles. So it basically ended up being a letter to myself. So it's not even a letter that I addressed to a family member or a friend or a fictional character. It is still to myself. And I sometimes think one of the best functions of writing, at least for me, can be the conversation with self that happens on the page, you know? And I, so you, you've said this word selfish. I would say it's not selfish and it's actually incredibly, um, and this goes for all of our writers, um, incredibly brave to share with an audience sort of the, the, the creativity that you make, especially when it is something that, that connects to these personal feelings. Um, I wanted to ask you, <laughs> I apologize if this is slightly uh, on the nose, but if you were to write a one line letter right now to either yourself now or to anybody in the audience tonight so a single line what would your one line letter say that is putting me on this one because uh (laughs) the audience knows it's not we haven't rehearsed any of this uh it's it's not going to sound very optimistic it's not going to sound um very positive i genuinely wish that i could sleep on like 15th march like go to bed lay my head on 15 march and wake up whenever this ends, that would literally be my letter. That if you can devise some sort of sleeping potion, like we've discussed fairy tales in this talk, I wish, I, I genuinely wish I could just like sleep through this. I, I know people talk about struggles and becoming more resilient and becoming stronger and ah, I would give all of that up to be who I was before all of this started. Because um, I write this in my letter as well. My name is Sonali, which in Hindi means um, golden. And I have friends who've called me like golden child because they say that I'm always exuding positivity. I always have a light around me. And I genuinely feel like it's been dimmed a little bit over this past year. So I would give up everything I've learned, all the lessons I've learned, how resilient I've become just to be back, just to get back where I was. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I wasn't a positive note. <laughs> No, but what I was thinking as I was hearing is, um, I was thinking about like how, what it means for you to say what you've said as well. And that actually the, the letter in that is that there is something in vulnerability, there is something in honesty, there is something in owning and reflecting and not being like, <laughs> everything is fine. You know, like how I said, I'm like, everything is fine. When, um, it's almost like that, that famous meme, but actually, so I think the letter that I'm taking from your answer is that it is okay to speak honestly and speak truthfully. And there is power in that. And I really hope that our audience members tonight go on the website and read Dear Sonali, because although you, you've said, you know, it's, it's personal and to me, it resonates for the reader. Um, before we go, how can we follow you um, on socials and things? How can we? First of all, thank you for saying that. I've had some comments from people saying that they could see their own stories in my letter, which I found interesting because again, it is so personal. But um, yeah, you can find all of my details for the socials on my website, which is sonalimistra.com. Um, and I'm on Facebook and Instagram and um, Twitter. So you can find me there. Amazing. Honestly, Sonali, a a pleasure. Um, Thank you so much for joining your voice with Fresh Ink. And next up, um, we will be joined by J.D. Stewart. Hey, J.D. Hello. A joy to have you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm grand. I'm grand. I've survived a webcam mishap and, <laughs> and time. You're doing, it. You're doing great. <laughs> it's, it's so lovely to have you. Um, and thank you so much for your piece. Please answer the phone. Um, I was wondering, like your um, sibling contributors, if you could share with us a wee intro to insight into what your piece is about. Yeah, sure. Um, so please answer your phone. I need to tell you that I love you is a 18 page play um, sort of channeling the character of me's experience um, throughout the year of 2020. Um, living alone, working in a grocery store. Um, yeah, that's that's what it's about, really. <laughs> I loved it. And I 
I feel that it, it resonated a lot with some of my own experiences of the pandemic, a bit like what we were saying with Sonali just there about how what you've created from your, your personal place resonates, you know, with your readers. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you, so you said about channeling the self through character. So what was that process like of channeling a huge year, huge experiences and the self onto the page and through into characters and, and moving language and comedy? What was that experience like? Well, I mean, the, I'll be honest, the title came first um, and I kind of came up with the title because I, I played around with a couple of things, but then I was like, well, if it's going to be archived and someone's going to look at this in a hundred years, I want them to be like, oh, what's that about? So I was like, let's put in a title that's like sort of bold and, and out there. And I knew from that how it would end and I knew that it would start where it would start. So then the rest was sort of filling in all those blanks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, it took me a while to get the structure until I came across um, the, the awful death count on the Guardian website yeah. as they sort of, um, which I listed at the opening. Um, and I felt like that was a good way to, to move through it mm -hmm. um, and to break it up and also to sort of incorporate um, digital because obviously mm -hmm. our lives became so digital throughout last year. Um, and for to be able to hand it to someone and be like, here, have fun you know, and with this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I used some aspects of my experience and, and others from other experiences I'd heard and sort of pulled things in um, to, yeah, to create that. And it it definitely, you know, so when you talk about the, the count, um, which in the YouTube video, you know, it's like the, the news voice that comes through, um, and it just adds as you're reading this piece this sense of of growing fear and growing you know it's very skillfully done but for me it really captured you know that, that's what it felt like um and you also draw in the voices of uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Boris Johnson and the the news because that's all we were exposed to but also you have some inanimate objects as characters as well um I'm thinking stuffed toys I'm thinking dating app um so I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about why you chose to bring those to life, you know, why you wanted voice in the piece to come from a stuffed toy and from a dating app, because I loved that. I just, I mean, like, I lived alone, you know, and like, I realised that I'm really funny over last year by myself, that I'm hilarious. Um, and I spent a lot of time talking to the things in my apartment, you know, like I would, like, there was days when I didn't talk to anyone. Um, and so like the conversations that I had out loud became with other things that were there. Um, and so, yeah, it felt natural to me to include like that within, within it, you know, and to sort of, again, to reflect on the loneliness and being alone. And, and I imagine people who weren't on their own would talk to, talk to things, you know, um, just to sort of mull things over and, and speak them out. But yeah, that was sort of, the reason why mm, it's it's wonderful honestly it's um it's a beautiful piece in the way it combines humor but also that emotion um so thank you for that was that something that was easy to to write was that you naturally yeah I mean I think I always try and like I want other people to be able to access LGBTQ stories mm -hmm. um, and I think that was another reason like I didn't necessarily name everyone um and even the you character you know please mm -hmm. answer your phone I need to tell you that I love you because I feel like as a as a world love is so loaded but like I also think it's like friend love it's paternal love it's familial love you know like it's and there were multiple times throughout last year where I was like I just want to let this person know that I love them you know like whether whoever it may be um just in case, you know, and I feel like a lot of us lived in a just in case something happens mm -hmm. sphere. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think I've forgotten what you asked me and I don't know if I answered. It doesn't matter what I asked because <laughs> your answer was a joy. Um, Sorry. <laughs> your answer was very, very wonderful. Um, before we, we have to say goodbye and I hate saying goodbye, mm -hmm. uh, but before we do, how do our audience members follow your work for, for more of your great stuff? Well, I have a website, jdstewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T dot org. 
Um, I'm not an organization, but it was the only thing that was available. Um, and I'm also on Twitter and Instagram um, at jdizzle, J-D-I-Z-Z-L-E, Stuart. So you can find Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, JD. Um, a pleasure to have you. And as we say goodbye to JD, um, we're going to journey next to Jude Reed. Um, hey, Jude. And you're, and you're still at work as well. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a it's a pleasure. Um, as as you've seen with your your siblings, <laughs> I'm calling you all siblings. Um, so far, can you tell us a wee bit more about your piece? Um, so my piece is a short story called Magpie, and it's, it it grew out of the thoughts that I had about the pandemic. Obviously, um, I'm a doctor in my day job. You can see I'm still wearing the costume, um, and I, I I just couldn't stop thinking about how. It, how what we were experiencing in the early days of the pandemic, when we had no specific treatments for COVID, um, how that was so much the same the same experience that doctors throughout history must have had, the, the ability to identify a disease, but really uh, lacking the ability to intervene other than providing you know, best supportive care. So I ended up writing about a woman who saw various pandemics throughout time and how, the, how her experience changed each time, but also was repeated over and over again um, for various reasons. Oh, it's you know and hearing you explain it like that as well for some reason I'm taken back to pretty much almost everybody since Sean like almost everybody has said this word connection you know and how you're connecting to to doctors through time um which is fascinating um with your piece it's one of the pieces that I found almost the most escapist um it's got a historical setting there's a slight uh magical tone shall we say without giving too many spoilers but it also deals most directly with the with the virus with pandemics with plague itself so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about why you chose to write about 2020 using the sort of historical and the magical. I think I needed to put uh, I, I needed to put some distance in because uh, any time I've tried to write directly about my experience of it it's, it's still too raw um, but I found having that the difference, distance between me and the character, the historical setting, um, the unreality of it made it easier to write about. Although the, the year really has had an air of unreality to it, it's it's almost had that sense that whenever you step back, it's hard to believe that it's happening. Mm. Um, so I think that was where it came from. Yeah, like 100%. Um, it captures that, that sense of the surreal. Um, and I was very struck as well, reading your piece, um, that... How do I say this without spoilers? That there's a theme of immortality that's quite central to your piece. And I always think of archives as in some ways one of the closest things we can get to immortality. So how does it feel to know that your piece is going to be in the archive, you know, and as I think JD said, in, you know, in a hundred years from now, someone might read it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a, it's a lovely thought and I hope that a doctor in a hundred years time reads it and thinks, oh yeah, she she thinks the same way I do about these things. I think that would be what I would like next. Yeah. Um, and I find you very, a very page turning writer, um, an incredibly immersive, incredibly absorbing writer. Would you say that that's what you go for as a reader as well? A story is something you escape into? Absolutely. Yes. Just losing yourself in a book is, is one of the best things. Um, and actually something I struggled with um, last year, I think just because the constant barrage of news uh, and the perpetual sense of worry it was very difficult to concentrate and I really missed being able to read a book and lose myself in it and it's taken quite a lot of time to to have the time and the, the mental space to be able to do that again but yeah hugely important to me. Yeah well you've you've given a gift um to all of us with your piece because we it really it really is a piece that takes you away and and loses you in it and captures so much of 2020 while still being like you say at a distance and it's it's so lovely to have you as well so soon after um, some of our fresh ink writers have written directly from the what happened and some have written like you say in this magical way and it's just so beautiful to have you all together. Um, if we want to keep following you Jude, if you want to know what what is coming next from you, please tell me there was a novel in the works. Um, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> and there is a novel in the works but I'll not jinx it. Um, <laughs> you you can find me on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is squinty witch, all one word. 
Um, and that's usually where I go on about whatever I'm writing. So you can find me there. And I promise if the, if the novel is ever removed from its drawer and edited, <laughs> as is the plan, and it sees publication, then I will certainly be talking about it there. Oh, honestly, I and the Fresh Ink readers honestly can't wait. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your piece because it really, it took us away while putting us there as well. I don't quite know how to describe it, but it took us away whilst giving us that feeling of a doctor wanting to help her patients. Um, so thank you so much. And I hope the doctors in the future that there is that connectivity. Um, I think it's a, a beautiful thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jude. Bye. And next up we have, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're here on our last, um, our last read of the light, May Dian Sangu. May, are you welcome to the Zoom stage? Hi Nadine, how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? I'm good May, how are you? Yeah, having a lovely time and it, we're just in such great company tonight and I'm just amazed at everything I'm hearing. Um, so yeah, congrats everyone. It's hard not to like lose myself in each person. I keep having to, um, I can, actually you can see on the camera, like lean forward. <laughs> <laughs> I have to pull back. Um, but let me lose myself in, in your words for the next five minutes. Um, May, tell me like your, your siblings have about your piece. So I wrote a series of poems, I think maybe between eight and ten. I'm not, maybe you'll know better than I did. I just wrote it then I forgot about it. <laughs> um, about my experience as a black person um, in 2020, while of course there was a lot of coverage about a big a lot of coverage about the, the murder of George Floyd and as someone who, my, myself and my partner, actually organised a protest up here in Aberdeen and so I, with this, with these poems, I really wanted to kind of speak to the complexity and the nuances of that, those experiences, it wasn't really just as simple as oh, a really horrible racist incident has happened because that happens all the time. Um, it was just, this has happened. It's been magnified. Everyone is kind of up in arms about it. And there were, you know, a lot of conflicting feelings there about, well, should I be grateful? Should I be kind of at resentful that you're paying attention now? Should I be cynical? It was kind of all these things. Um, and yeah, just the, the, the process as well of kind of, understanding race is something that kind of happens to you that you're not really born with and you you know like it kind of seemed to me like a few months into 2020 everyone kind of agreed that black people existed <laughs> and have having been black for a long time I don't say all my life because there comes a certain point when you start to understand what that means um, and these were all the kind of things that I was trying to um, say in I guess not all poems to say all those things through through the lens of my own experience um, of the events of 2020. Mm. And you say, you know, very rightly that in your work you're trying to to speak to complexity and nuance, and you're also bringing in personal narratives and, and narratives around childhood as well. And you're doing so in poetry that is so deliberate and so the way you use form you know you've got a golden shovel like so so tight and so wonderful May and I was wondering if you could tell me about your process of how you went about gathering so much and so much feeling and putting it into these poems that are so deliberate um, and so tight in their form and, and so great. Yeah um, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that about form because when I got your feedback I was like oh thank you that's so lovely but I kind of think of myself as someone who hasn't consciously gone about studying craft and like what is a poem I've just sort of kind of decided well this is I don't know what poems are but this is what my poems are and this is how my poetry comes um so I think my process is um hyper fixation and obsessively being able to get lost in a task um and for me I would I don't know I would have I would have all these kind of thoughts um, I'd have many tabs open at once and it's just kind of the way that my brain works. I would be copying and pasting lots of things and they'd all be going down and I would just kind of like, um, I'm a spoken word artist, I think I am that before, before I'm a writer, so actually vocalising and saying the things out loud is a very important part of the process. So I would just, I would be speaking it and if I knew what I wanted to say, but I couldn't quite understand how to say it, I would say it out loud and then write it down and I realised, well, actually, no, that's fine. That's poetic enough. 
Um, so yeah, I, 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 yeah, when people talk to me about process, I just, I don't know, I just, <laughs> I just sit, <laughs> I just sit down in between procrastinating and um, that's why my, my two extremes are getting really, really kind of into something and lost in it and then avoiding it for ages or procrastinating with the thing that I'm becoming obsessed with. So I would say that's my process. <laughs> But you say, oh, you know, I don't know what to say about process. And then you tell me this amazing, fascinating stuff about your process that I'm just like, yes, yes. Um, so actually, it's it's really great to hear you talk about it. And in particular, I love what you said of sort of, because um, again, it resonates with my own approach of not having come from a, like, this is how you write poems background of being like, you know, this is my voice. These are my poems. And that there's something incredibly important and necessary in that. And you talk too about speaking truth and I know that that activism is something that's incredibly important to you so I was wondering how poetry and activism and truth speaking merge for you and what the power is of blending those things. Um, I think for me I think kind of like poetry as a well specifically again spoken word as kind of a vehicle to kind of like get up on a a space and a stage and just kind of have a rant basically that's how I kind of started writing poetry or, or doing spoken word was I kind of felt a bit angry about something normally a social justice issue and um, I figured out that actually it wasn't too difficult to make it rhyme and give it a good rhythm and then I would say it on stage and that's <laughs> that's kind of how I got into it so for me it's I, I think when you're a marginalized person just you taking up space and making sure that your voice is heard somehow, even if it's just in a tiny little bar somewhere in Aberdeen and um, with like 60 people in the audience, like listening to your spoken word piece and enjoying it. I think that can be so empowering because it's difficult to find those spaces, you know, kind of like in the mainstream, you know. And um, so for me, that is, I think that's a really important, um, I don't know, kind of like art, artivism. Mm, as part of like the blend of taking up space speaking your truth and and that is for me that's a comfortable way to do activism that doesn't enjoy that doesn't I do also go in the marches as well but <laughs> um I, I think it's important to to be able to tap into that creativity and mm. um, yeah so I think that there's definitely an overlap in that for me Oh, everything you say is just resonating and I want to want to touch you more. I want to ask you more about sort of telling our own stories on our own terms and in our own words. But unfortunately, our event is coming to a close. And even though I want to keep talking to all of you more, um, May, thank you so much for sharing. How do we follow your work and, and keep in touch with your beautiful poems? Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, at it's it's like if you imagine ukulele, but it's ukulele May. So U K L E M A E. I can't even spell ukulele, but if you can spell it, just put a May on the end. Um, and also on Instagram, but I don't really use it very much. Um, but yeah, that's where that's where you can find me. Oh, honestly, May. Thank you so much, and thank you for sort of bringing this to a close of what's been such a beautiful night and cannot express how much I wish that I could just keep speaking with all of you it's, a, it's been a real honor to be the person who gets to ask the questions and, and gets to hear from you all um, and before we close tonight um, I just want to say thank you to everybody thank you to all of our our fresh inkers um, thank you to Sean Y Kyung thank you to Nazmi McCartney thank you to Susie Kelly Thank you to Sam Clark. Thank you to Candice Perwin. Thank you to Amy Jardine. Thank you to Sonali Misra. Thank you to JD Stewart. Thank you to Jude Reed. And thank you to Mady and Sangu um, who saw us out there. And thank you so much to Beth and Kenny behind the scenes, to our panelists, um, Michelle, Alan, Colin, and myself, um, to everybody who's who's put so much in, to you, the audience who are coming tonight. There are so many thank yous. Um, and a reminder before we go that you can access more information about our 10 writers, read their contributions, listen to them read an extract via the website www.nls.uk forward slash fresh dash ink. And please do uh, tweet, fleet, shout about us with glee because this is a great set of 10 writers and they put their, their hearts into this. Um, and I'm so grateful to have talked to them all. Um, I am Lady Naisha Jasset. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of the National Library of Scotland. 
and I wish you all a wonderful evening.